monetizing digital services since 2004, boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG, where innovation meets monetization. LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Kathy Enderez about the new report out from the Josh Burson Company, The Definitive Guide to Pay Equity, Increasing Productivity, Innovation, and Sustainability. Kathy Enderez, welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be back with you today. This is what, maybe your fourth or fifth time even on the podcast. And today we're going to be talking about the most recent report out from the Josh Burson Company titled The Definitive Guide to Pay Equity, Increasing Productivity, Innovation, and Sustainability. And I really love everything about the title of the report, but of course, the contents of the report are even better uh, and provide all sorts of really cool insights. So that's what we're going to be unpacking together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Kathy's bio again with everybody. Kathy Enderez is Senior Vice President of Research and a Global Industry Analyst at the Human Capital Advisory Firm, the Joss Burson Company, the world's largest community for HR. She has over 20 years of global experience in human capital, talent performance management, and change management from consulting with IBM, PricewaterhouseCooper, Ernst & Young, and other industry areas, working with companies of various sizes from Fortune 500 companies to startups in multiple industries, including technology and healthcare, and leading research on all topics of HR, talent, and technology. She is passionate about making work better and more meaningful. And I could really go on and on, but I'm going to pause there and Thank give you a chance to Kathy, to share anything else about yourself, your background that you would like the audience to know. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And I know this was a long <laughs> intro. Um, as it relates to pay equity, this is such a um, such a fascinating topic for me and such a relevant topic as, as it, uh, it relates to creating equity for everybody, um, not just on the pay side, but overall for work opportunities, career opportunities. And all of the above. And I, I go back to where I started my career in, in management consulting back in Austria when I was, um, uh, actually the only female consulting consultant, um, in within like 50 male consultants. And I had some opportunities that I was actually not put on their projects because the client said, we're not taking a female consultant. You have to put a woman on the, on mm. the, on the team. And of course that impacted my pay potentially eventually because I couldn't get that, this great project that would have helped me with my career. Um, yes. and I think we've come a long way in some, some sense, of course, but some, in some aspects, maybe we haven't come such a long way. So I think that's how, how I see all of this topic relate to maybe some, some of the background that I have. Certainly, uh, there have been improvements for sure in some aspects, but in other aspects, man, we, we still tend to be just about as far behind in terms of pay equity as we have been, you know, for the last 20 plus years. That's right. And in some cases, the pandemic has exacerbated the problem and, and many analysts have suggested that we've set back uh, pay equity uh, even a generation just during the last three years during the pandemic. So it'll be interesting to hear your perspective on that with this report from the Josh Burson company. Well, why don't we 
dive on in. And if you can start by just providing us a little bit of an overview to the methodology of this, of the data collection and of putting together this report. Yeah, for sure. We'll do. So what we've done as we, as we always approach our research, first we did a lot of interviews and just discussions with companies to understand what they're doing in pay equity. How did they see the problem? What is it even about for them? Do they even do anything on that? That helped inform for us um, how we set up actually a big study. So then we set out a big survey um, of like 20, 28 or something um, specific pay equity practices that are not just pay practices. There are also broader talent practices and governance practices and all of that. And we asked 448 companies around the world uh, responded to, to this survey, which was, which was great. And we got a lot of good insights and examples to that too. And we, what we always do for these studies too is we also ask all these companies about their business performance, about their, are they financially high performing? Do they satisfy their customers? How well are they able to attract and retain uh, the right talent? What are they perceived as a great place to work? Do they get diverse talent? Do they get the needed talent? And then also how innovative they are and how change adaptable they are. So, so that's how we, um, we did the big study, survey based study. And then we saw from, from these insights, both some descriptive insights as well as some prescriptive insights or some predictive insights on what of these practices that you can actually do in pay equity actually drive the biggest outcomes. And then we interviewed more companies, had more conversations to validate that and got some really great case studies and examples in there as well. Uh, so that's how we came up with yes. some of these insights that that we have in there. Wonderful. And and I'll just note that uh, the the link to the full report is in the show notes. So anyone can uh, go check that out via that link, or you can just Google the definitive guide to pay equity, Josh Person company, it'll come right up uh, and you can uh, get access to the executive summary and uh, the full report. So there's all sorts of really great tidbits here. And I appreciate the overview of the methodology and I appreciate the mixed methods approach uh, that you continue to use in all of these reports, uh, because I think that provides a real richness um, behind, you know, to understand better what's going on within organizations and what really could be improved over time. So one of the points that uh, comes out in the report is that 95% of companies are not practicing pay equity well and may ignore the topic or consider it a one-time project. Let's unpack that a little bit. First of all, what do you mean by not practicing pay equity well? So when we say 95% aren't practicing pay equity well, that's self-reported. What does that mean exactly? And then when people are, when organizational leaders are are considering it a one-time project, what does that mean? And what does that look like? Yeah, and so the 95% were actually not self-reported. We didn't ask them, are you practicing this well? We we asked them about some underlying practices. Oh, I understand. And and then Mm -hmm. we created a maturity model to say, who is doing most of these practices that matter most well? So we didn't ask them, are you doing it well or not? We asked them, what are you doing on, for example, mitigating bias when you hire somebody? What practices do you have when you mitigate bias, when you bring in um, promotions, um, how, how how do you get funding for for pay equity adjustments? Those kind of like actual things. And so when we uh, then grouped companies together into four levels of maturity, the highest level of maturity are those that we perceive to be doing pay equity well. And it was only five percent, which is by the way the smallest percentage of all the studies that we have done. So we yeah. always see four level maturity I... models, which is the least impact or least advanced practice. Go ahead. Can, can I drill in just a little bit? So that's that's yeah. wonderful. That that's an even better metric then because you're you have a very thorough methodology to how you're um, how you're attributing that uh, yeah. that ninety five percent. I'm curious. Did, did do you have any ability to compare your assessment of organizations' pay equity practices? versus what they think their pay equity practices are. So I could see the value in 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 uh looking at the gap between yeah. they they think they're awesome but they're really crummy <laughs> and how valuable that could be for organizations. Yeah, it's a great question and uh what the way that we went about that was actually a couple of ways. Well, we asked them to describe their pay equity overall strategy and approach in one word and generally speaking those that are less advanced based on our methodology also perceive it's like like very like non-existent or they use words like um like backward looking or like 
just compliance oriented or something like that versus those that actually um, do all the, the good things that we identified as like the most impactful things. Uh, they use words like we are kind of leading class, world class. So it generally correlates actually their self-assessment co correlates with how we uh, saw them, which was great. So that's that self-assessment. The other thing that we also studied, which was fascinating too, is what are their actual, what is their actual pay gap between women and men, for example, and the um, the high performing those level four companies had literally all, mostly close to cape pay gap. So very very small percentage had a gap between ten percent, uh, like zero uh, percent or one percent and ten percent, and most of them had no pay gap. Versus the low performing companies had a much larger percentage in the even like 30%, 40% gap of uh, women and men, for example. So we asked about that too. So it, it it did, usually companies are kind of up to up to speed to how good they are in, in this. So it was interesting to see because sometimes I agree with you, the self-assessment doesn't really correspond with the actual assessment of practices. Yeah, well, that's good to know. I mean, yeah. if uh, knowing and having a realistic view of things is half the battle sometimes <laughs> with this topic. So if you realize, yeah, we're really not where we need to be, that's a really great first step. And then you can start to put in uh, to place practices to help you improve things. Uh, so that's wonderful. Anything else from that finding, the 95% of companies are not practicing pay equity well that you want to highlight uh, specific aspects yeah. um, that maybe they're struggling with more than others? Well, uh, what they are actually, yeah, there's some interesting insights that we got from the study. We said that uh, we identified that actually seven in 10 um, CEOs, or like, mostly CEOs, actually say pay equity is critical to their people and their business strategy, which is great, right? So there's lots of commitment there. A lot of companies actually have that, like, we, we, we know it's important. We don't think it's just a pay thing. We don't think it's just an analytic thing. We really think... This is important for our company. Um, so that was great. They make rewards and recognition for rewards and recognition part of their company priorities. Um, and they have C-suite sponsorship of pay equity. 58% have C-suite sponsorship. So that's great. So lots of commitment, lots of like talk about it. But what's really missing is the organizational action and the, 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 the funding for it, the investment to it. Um, and communicating about it transparently. Only 11% transparently communicate their pay equity work to anybody, really, including leaders, but even employees. Um, and only 14% set aside enough budget to actually address any pay equity issues. And as we know, like this can be a significant budgetary requirement. If you know about the issues, you got to address them. And if you don't address them, Yes. If you don't have the budget set aside, right? You can't really make traction. So yeah, sure. Yeah, it, well, and another piece of this, I mentioned many are ignoring the topic altogether or consider it a one-time yeah. project. Yeah. So on the one hand, many are recognizing that, yeah, we're not where we need to be. Um, their self-assessment is, is fairly consistent with your evaluation. Uh, but some, many even, are suggesting eh, it's not that big of a deal or it's something we can kind of focus on for a short period of time and then move on. Any additional thoughts around that? Yeah, so the one-time uh, project it was really interesting because most companies – See this as a one-time thing to do. They said, well, we look at it once a year, we do some analysis, then maybe we do some corrections, and they even call it corrections, as if there was a mistake made or something like that. Um, and then they don't look at it for a year. And what happens then with a lot of companies, they get the same issues again a year later, of course, because if you don't dive into the root causes of what caused these inequities, we don't look at deeper into do you need to change something in your hiring practices. Do you need to change something in your mobility practices? Do you need to think about differently about pay for performance, about what projects people get? Like to my example of the, the projects that I didn't get that eventually impacted my pay opportunities, of course. Um, all of these related things are not in the purview really of the comp team or the people analytics team, but they have to bring these up to the right people and the right teams to actually make traction on that. So if you like look at it only once a year and never look at it again and don't establish root causes, 
it's almost guaranteed that the problem will never get smaller because we'll never like really address the problem. Yeah. And you kind of referred to this already, but uh, the report shows that a significant 71% of companies acknowledge pay equity is vital aspect of the real world people and business strategy, while only 14% are really demonstrating sufficient investment uh, into uh, managing pay equity on an ongoing basis. Maybe we can drill into that a little bit more. Do you, do you see anything else behind the scenes going on that can help explain that um, that issue? Monetizing digital services since 2004. Boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG, where innovation meets monetization. Yeah, I think it has to do with, with a couple of things. First, it has to do with... Um, it's easier to say you do something than actually put your money behind it, right? Because where, where's the money coming from? You're going to think about, is this actually an investment that yields some business return? Because businesses are there for, for business purposes, right? Yeah. Although, like, of course, defending against the legal risk or a compliance risk is, is a fair business purpose. In reality, that's not something that drives really a significant investment that could be as big as, I don't know, 3% of payroll sometimes, right? So, uh, which is a lot. So, um, what we've seen some companies and actually one of the, the largest tech technology companies that we interviewed on their pay equity practices, what they do is they told us for us in our compensation strategy, pay equity is really the foundation. Whatever budget I get uh, that the head of total rewards told me, um, whatever budget I get, I first dedicate to fixing any pay equity issues and also looking at addressing any from any issues reoccurring. And only then when I have fixed that budget, I actually think about they see it as a pyramid. So they say pay equity, then they see the broad based compensation. And then on top of it, they see um, differentiating skills and, and roles that are like significant for the company's strategy and, and business performance. So what they told us is we focus on the pay equity first, then we go on the top level of differentiating and then we go to the middle layer and so they told us which i thought was very interesting to say um i told the board is what she said whatever money you give me the first we gotta pay um like uh, basically mitigate pay equity and she, and she was she's really right about that uh because what we identified is pay equity actually gives you um a lot of benefits beyond just legal compliance and all of that. It, it's the number one most impactful practice actually in well-being, believe it or not. So that was interesting when we studied and did a big study on well-being. We said the number one thing you can do for your employees' well-being is pay them fairly and equitably and let them know you're doing that, which we found fascinating because that and it makes sense, right? Because if people are worried and, and stressed about their pay levels and think they can't collaborate with somebody because maybe they are paid unfairly and all of that. It impacts that. It also was the most impactful thing of all the pay practices you could do. And it's 13 times more impactful than actually having high levels of pay, which we found mind boggling. So in other words, how you distribute the money that you have on pay is much more impactful than like throwing a lot of money and benefits at people. So, so yeah. that was all fascinating to, to hear. Yeah, super interesting. And it, historically, as we look at this, it's it's been 60 years since John F. Kennedy's uh, prohibition of explicit policies that resulted in unequal pay between men and women. But there still continues to be big lawsuits that get a lot of attention around this. There, a recent one, a $118 million settlement back in June of 2022, who were paid less than their male counterparts. And we, we continue to see these things over and over again. Yeah. Um, so where, where do you see this, you know, pay equity overall? Where does it sit among the, the significant issues that organizations are facing and the type of undisclosed problems that we might continue to have in the, the American workplace? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, the, the American, not, not just the American workplace, but then also the international workplace is really paying attention to it now. And I think with the, with right cause and these lawsuits, of course, make a lot of headlines and maybe scare people. Uh, but it's, it's like a lot of laws that are coming into place right now. For example, pay transparency laws, 
the um, like banning being asked for salary history that has been in place in many many uh, states here in the U.S. and and some companies have actually in, implemented that uh, independent of laws. I think getting in front of the laws is really where companies should be at. Um, one of the total rewards leaders that I talked with, they told me, "Well, I don't want to be just legally compliant. I want to be leading in this. I want to lead my in the industry to be known for being the most." equitable and fair in terms of compensation, but then also in terms of all other opportunities that I have for for the company, um, for employees, because it helps me attract people and retain people and win the war for talent, which is, I think, still on. Um, and by the way, I think one thing that uh, pay equity sometimes gets the bad press is it's sometimes perceived as not being performance oriented or skills oriented. But what we found out, these 5% of companies that do pay equity well, they're really balancing um, performance orientation, individual performance, team performance, and skill, like paying for skills with being equitable because they're not really in contradiction at all. It wouldn't be fair if one person performs 10 times better, objectively speaking, to be paid the exact same amount of the right. person that make, like, just produces a 10th, right? I mean, that wouldn't be fair. So uh, being fair and equitable is is really about just removing these inequities as they relate to gender, ethnicity, race, uh, age, uh, sexual orientation, all of the diversity I mentioned, but not being not performance oriented. I think that's why it sometimes gets a bad rap of like being just equality, which is not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know you, you had a list of 84 employee experience strategies fair and equitable rewards ranked as the fifth most important factor um, maybe talk a little bit more about that and, and some, how it fits within the, all of those strategies and, and what you make of all that. Yeah, that was, that was a, like a really interesting, interesting insight too. When we studied employee experience, we looked at all the things. We looked at the work. We looked at the, uh, we looked at the management uh, practices of the company. We looked at the, the, the workplace, the physical, the digital, the cultural workplace. We looked at health and well-being and growth opportunities and development opportunities and trust in leadership in the organization. And one, one of the practices we studied there was um, a few compensation practices. So we looked at levels of rewards, uh, like how much you pay and what rewards you give people. Um, but then like how much, but then also how fair is it? And the fair and equitable was such a like leading indicator of um, employee experience, engagement, retention, attraction, so much more than um, level of pay. And I, I think about it, for example, um, Microsoft has been like a model, I think, of pay equity and they produce their pay equity statistics in their DEI, publicly available DEI report every year. And they show like literally like what their pay gaps are and how they're tracking and what they're doing on all of that. And they've been doing that for years, but they're not the tech company that pays like these lavish amounts of money, but yet they're very, like always considered a great place to work and very highly esteemed. So uh, if you compare them to other tech companies that like have all them, I don't know the buses and the free food and the, like like outsized salary and all of that, they're still not having an easier time attracting and retaining the right talent or performing well as an organization. I think it also has to do, pay equity also, and we showed that with the data too, has to do with innovation. And innovation you only get when, um, when you have diversity of thoughts and diversity of perspectives. And I think pay equity is a really big driver on, on diversity at all levels as well. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned Microsoft and other companies like Patagonia, Adidas, yeah. they, they show that pay equity is not just about fair and equitable pay and bonuses, but about creating a culture of equity and inclusion throughout the organization, as you just mentioned with the Microsoft example, maybe tell us a little bit more about the Patagonia and Adidas examples as well, and how they're fitting all of this into the broader lens of, of inclusion and belonging. Yeah, and they are all very different companies, right? So Patagonia is not really almost a, a company in that sense. They're very vocal that they are really trying to change society and the environment and all of that. So they have very different pay philosophies. Added Adidas is, is of course, a very different company too. So that's why we're calling the, the three out because they're very different industries, very different companies, have very different pay philosophies and people philosophies and business strategies. 
but yet they made their pay equity work actually directly into their their model. So not starting, not trying to copy anybody else's pay equity journey, of course, but starting with who you are as a company, what's your strategy, what's your business strategy, what's your people strategy, and how does uh, your reward strategy now support all of this, and how big is pay equity actually as a um, a theme in your employee value proposition, and all of these actually made that core and uh, part and parcel of their overall employee value proposition as they talk about people in very different ways, of course, because they're very different companies. So just personalizing that narrative and saying, why is this so important for us? Because we're trying to accomplish very different things, right? Um, for Adidas, for example, it might be very important for their R&D because when you do R&D on products, you need very innovative and very different perspectives, right? And Patagonia wants to try, try to change the world overall. Um, very different perspective there too. So each of these companies need very different things from their people. But in the end of the day, they always say, if we don't have pay equity, we really don't have equity. We don't have diversity. We don't have, we can't really accomplish what we need to uh, to set out as a business. Yeah. Well said, Kathy. This has been a great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, the Josh Burson company, where they can find this report, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Time has flown. So I could talk about this for another hour or so, and I I would. Uh, But yeah, so getting in touch with me, I'm on LinkedIn, Kathy Enderes. You can find me right there. Uh, the Josh Burson Company. We have our website is uh, joshburson.com, and we have lots of, of uh, insights and and uh, material on there. And you also put the the link to a report in there, which is great. So thank you for that. Um, and um, yeah, so the last final words, um, pay equity. Uh, I mean, the the way that I think about pay equity, it's really not a compensation project. It's not a people analytics project. It's not even a rewards project or an HR project. It's really a way to run your company in an inclusive and equitable way. And if you think about that, uh, how how big the impact is, not just to your business, but then also to the environment and to the society, I think there is no there should be no doubt on why it's it's such a big topic. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. It's really been a pleasure. Good to have you back. You're welcome back anytime. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Kathy and the Josh Burson Academy can do for you. Check out the re- the full report. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.